Welcome everyone to this new episode of The Next Page, our podcast of the Library and Archives in UN Geneva. Today we're going to talk about rapid technological change and future-proof policy making together with Conrad Seifert, who's the co-founder of the Simon Institute for Long-Term Governance. In this episode also, we continue the exploration along the journey to the summit of the future in 2024. The summit will be a key moment to reaffirm and recommit to effective multilateralism in the interest of both people and the planet. But how do we set out to redesign a multilateralism and craft the future we all want in our era of ultra-rapid technological change? And how do we integrate in today's decisions the legitimate interest of future generations? Can we still rely on classical forms of decision-making? Can we trust AI? and other emerging technologies to remain tools at our service instead of becoming our masters. This is what we're going to discuss in this episode. Conrad Seifert is the co-founder, I said it before, of the Simon Institute for Long-Term Governance. He has also co-founded earlier in his life uh, and led the Effective Altruism Switzerland platform. And he's attuned and used to developing theories of change and looking at the future beyond the current generation. Conrad, welcome to UN Library and Archives. Welcome to our podcast and to this episode. Please tell our audience about yourself and your professional trajectory. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I guess my trajectory really started 10 years ago when I arrived in Geneva initially to become a snowboard instructor and learn French and then figure out what I would do afterwards. And <laughs> then I quickly took a liking of the degree of international exchange that happens in Geneva and thought instead of studying law, which was my initial plan, I should study international relations. And then while starting to study international relations, I figured that there are a lot of questions that the scholarship cannot really respond to and that I don't really know what to do afterwards. And that triggered questions with respect to how do I actually think about doing good in the world, which led me to this effective altruism community. And they had an online forum, so I just ended up discussing a lot there and eventually started the student club with somebody else I met by chance um, in my first semester, Max. And then we organized lots of meetups just around either philosophical questions of what does it mean to do good, how do we actually evaluate the impact of our actions, or much more concretely around what seem to be career paths that the world needs more of and what kind of methods, approaches, skills do we need to yeah, get there and really also make a difference in, in these roles. And that very quickly, this combination of interests, international relations and the kind of impact optimization questions led us to think about international relations very differently. So we looked at policy making and decision making more broadly, a lot of the behavioral science, a lot of institutional design questions. And we started modeling this a bit, started also doing some computational models where we just looked at what are attention dynamics, how do people influence each other's opinions, and how do these shift all of a sudden, and then attitudes towards a given topic are almost the inverse um, very suddenly. But then we realized that's practically not that useful <laughs> because a lot of the times to really change institutions, you can't get the data for the contextualization of these insights because nobody wants to give you the data because that would mean that they would have to change what they're doing. And <laughs> um, this, there's, a, there's a question of like getting buy-in from the people who would have to change what they're doing and we figured, okay, so we have to start engaging with these people. And that turned out to first be a mini working group of this student association that slowly grew into and a big interview series with policymakers and academics on just decision-making under uncertainty, how people think about the future and how they deal with the fact that um, they operate in a very complex environment and aren't always sure 
uh, what exactly the effects of their actions are. And yeah, then shortly before COVID, two years before, we started doing a bit of work on biosecurity because we had looked into what are the topics that are really pressing and neglected for the world. And we figured, okay, engineered pandemics is one thing. And we started engaging with the implementation support unit of the Biological Weapons Convention. And um, then shortly after, we had organized a bunch of side events to the meetings of the Biological Weapons Convention. Uh, COVID hit and people said, hey, you've been talking about something like this, right? Pandemics have been on your radar. And we said, yeah, the experts had predicted this. And a lot of the modeling also suggests this is going to happen more and more often. And we also knew that we're not really prepared for these disasters. And COVID is still one of the more benign versions. And whether it was uh, man-made or not didn't really matter because all we knew that was that it is like bad enough to already kill millions of people and it could get even worse and we should just be more prepared. And then we thought, okay, we are actually gaining some credibility despite being fairly young in this field. We've been able to help people make sense of the situation they're operating in, what the world looks like more and more, what rapid technological change, but also just rapid societal change really means and implies what for what we need to prepare for. And then we slowly started working on launching an organization because we thought, okay, there's clearly a niche here. There's a need for more support on decision making, on analysis, on also bringing in the technical experts, either from academia or the private labs. And um, bridging also the different worlds between New York and Geneva, um, between the Anglosphere and the rest of the world in many ways, as the Anglosphere is kind of leading a lot of the technological developments. And that just kind of resulted in the Simon Institute for Long-Term Governance, which is named after Herbert Simon, a Nobel Prize in Economics, and a Turing Award winner, which is the Nobel equivalent for AI research, essentially, who looked into administrative behavior and organizational theory. And this had a lot of thoughts very early on already on how machines, AI, etc., will affect um, human decision making, could potentially also become very symbiotic with it. And at the same time, also threatens the very fabric of our society because we're not prepared for it. So... Let's talk a little bit about the Simon Institute for Long-Term Governance. What do you do there? What is the mission? Can you elaborate a little bit on the vision, for example, a mission of the Institute? Yeah, I will start with the concrete mission and then go back to the vision. SI's mission is to support the development of international institutions that foster effective global governance of technological progress because we think that this is an issue that is relevant to all of us and that also needs the participation of everybody because what we're currently doing is shaping the future somewhat irreversibly even in ways that are not entirely consciously chosen or democratically chosen for that matter and we are kind of stumbling into a future that yes on one hand is very uncertain but on the other hand could be much more actively shaped by everybody. And that requires international infrastructure, while at the same time, this international infrastructure currently is non-existent and the infrastructure that we have is a bit too slow. So there are a lot of improvements to make. And there's also a need for the acknowledgement of the current geopolitical context or also just economic context where a lot of these developments are driven essentially by American companies. And that means that the international activity also has, has to acknowledge the fact that in the end it is the U.S. government that in many ways has to make very responsible decisions and we also shouldn't paint them in too black of a picture or antagonize them, but actually also help them to make more reasonable decisions and more representative decisions because the U.S. government also has a very tough job ahead of it 
with the regulation of these companies. And we need to figure out how to build up a stepping stone approach for international um, regulation, while at the same time not distracting from the quite urgent, to be honest, uh, regulation at the more national levels. And we are doing this in part because we think the future is probably quite exciting. And there's a small chance that in the process we screw up and <laughs> ruin that potential for an exciting future where there will be many, many more people probably who can all self-actualize, who can figure out what do I really want? How do I enjoy my life? What do I want to contribute? And just be extremely uh, happy and probably unusually for our standards, um, unusually colorful in, in life because if we continue the current trajectory of progress in, in technology, we will probably achieve sufficient degrees of recycling and resource use efficiency that a lot of people in the world can live at the standard that the current Swiss people live on. And arguably the Swiss society is something like a post-scarcity society in many ways. And um, hasn't entirely shifted its mindset yet, also in part because the rest of the world isn't yet there. And once that is the case, there will be a phase shift, hopefully, in attitudes, such that society becomes more cooperative and um, yeah, much easier to exchange different viewpoints because people feel less threatened in their very existence. So that kind of future vision is the the thing that excites us and then of course beyond that there's a, also a lot of open space in terms of how do we shape everything that comes afterwards then once we have had the shift in attitudes how do we actually decide to go further do we colonize the, the universe do we do we settle the stars essentially and um do we kind of do research on what different forms of life could look like and do we choose to bring them into existence or not and how do we help other current forms of life enjoy their existence better because currently we are not necessarily making life for a lot of, a lot of other animals uh, more pleasant and we are currently the only ones who seem to have the means to do so so at some point we should also assume that responsibility to take care of the rest of the animal species that seem to be conscious, that seem to have an internal experience and that also thus merit a happy lives. Yeah. And I, I see how long term is key to this vision. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about a little bit more because the long term, the, the idea and the concept are central to this realigning priorities you've been mentioned in this and and really thinking deeply into the future the future we want not only for us you said it for us for the planet for other living species that inhabit the same the same ecosystem together together with us it's also in the name of the of the institute you co-founded uh, the the long-term uh, governance is right there in the name nevertheless it is a relatively young concept, and um, while I would like to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on your idea of long term is and how this is important to the work you do in the Institute, I would like you also to tell us a little bit how realistic it is from your experience and perspective that policymakers will adhere to long term because it's it's really a characteristic of, of policy making and especially in our age and, and day and time that it's really anchored into short termings rather. So what are your considerations about this? Yeah. First of all I think it's not actually a phenomenon of our time. Humans have always kind of sucked at thinking long term. It's a phenomenon of our time that our actions have much more long term consequences and that they really shape the lives of generations to come and where AI could also really shape the entire possible space of futures altogether because then we really give the development of society into hands that are 
unlikely to be controllable by us because we wouldn't be able to make sense of it. And this, yeah, it is not necessarily getting harder to get people to think more long term. It's just a thing that we're really not used to as a species, as a society. And there are more and more people who are managing to do so. So I am somewhat optimistic that we can over time also build the culture that has this deeply ingrained in it, that we realize the degree of power and influence we have over the rest of the world and the rest of the future. So we have kind of expanded our awareness in the last decades of how much our local actions affect the rest of the planet. And I see the next step as kind of expanding our awareness of the influence we have also into the temporal dimension instead of just the geographical dimension. And we're seeing shifts there in various governments. And I think that is rather promising, whether that's the EU, uh, whether that's the UK, the US, people are waking up to the fact that maybe we are really on a trajectory where technology is such a driving force of kind of what things will look like, not just in 10 years, but in 100 years, potentially even in a 1,000 years, that um, we need to go well beyond the nuclear field to think about 10,000 years and really figure out, okay, uh, there, there are other things that might still be around in 10,000 years if we don't wipe ourselves off of this planet. And this if we don't wipe ourselves off of this planet consideration is also picking up um, acknowledgement because in the end there are lots of questions around how resilient our societies are, how resilient we are and they are open questions but the likelihood of something going very very wrong is not zero and while I think it's well below 30% I would still not want to get on a plane that has a even one in a hundred chance of crashing and thus I think it's worth trying to reduce the likelihood, even if it were at 1% of us killing ourselves. And this, yeah, not just looking ahead and saying, oh, the future is really, really exciting, which I like very deeply believe. I think on expectation, things are actually going to go well. We are advancing quite well. We are developing a lot of the technology we need and a lot of the um, cultural shifts that need to happen will happen very suddenly because that's what social dynamics usually look like. They are these phase shifts. And um, however, of course, we need to continue responsibilizing ourselves and in this process not get lost and too excited and thus also pay attention to the kind of outlier events that might hamper this progress. And yeah, I think that that view is becoming more common and I see it becoming also less of a lunatic view, like you don't need to be a transhumanist and think we all need to be replaced with things that uh, function differently <laughs> or um, as a lot of people might assume better. I'm very, very unsure about whether that's the case. I think... Um, yeah, you can also hold a lot of these views nowadays without seeming entirely crazy and futurist and just acknowledging the fact that this is actually the world we live in. And when we look at um, what all this means in terms of moving along in the journey towards the summit of the future, the United Nations version of what you're saying is let's get together first in 2023 with the summit the SDG summits and then immediately after one year later in 2024 uh, under the ages of the general assembly in both cases to talk about the summit of the future so why I'm saying that this is the United Nations version of it is because United Nations is essentially driven by interests that are brought forward by its member states nation states and although there are dynamics in modern multilateralism that are shifting multilateralism and enlarging it to civil society and other powerful forces in society it, they still relies on, on, on nation states as the main players the main actors and the main voices that are heard in the meeting rooms of, of the United Nations 
nevertheless, there has been a constant shift of attention from 2015 and even before when we were designing all together, not only the UN, the Agenda uh, 2030 for Sustainable Development, the shift to a more inclusive and participatory uh, multilateral. What I like a lot about what you're saying is the concept of becoming responsible for ourselves, for our decision making, for our the impact in terms and space, in, in terms of time and space of the decision we're making. I think we're going possibly rationally, we should find those elements reflected inside this the thing that we call the Summit of the Future, which is basically a high-level meeting that will take place in 2024. So I wanted to discuss with you how do we make sure that the future, the way you describe the future, is actually discussed at the Summit of the Future. <laughs> so what, you know, future means different things to different people. So I wanted to start with a little bit of more concrete discussion together with you on which are the shifts in narratives and attitudes that are needed to deal with the influence that our current rapid technological development that you're describing has on the lives of every everyone in the future. And so I wanted to, yeah, go dive deeper into what are these narratives? What are the attitudes that we have to change? How do we make sure that in a place like the Summit of the Future, we're really discussing the future that matters? Yeah, I think that's indeed uh, the the big practical question at the international level for, for the next year. And the way we're currently approaching this is by first also acknowledging the fact that there are very valid questions about the legitimacy of civil society engagement. Um, we haven't really figured out what international democracy looks like. And in the end, it is, of course, the extremely privileged people who have the resources to set up civil society organizations and thus, again, have more of a voice, even though they are already represented by their nation state or supposed to be represented by their nation state, um, which raises all kinds of questions in the UN context all the time. Uh, we saw this during COVID, where a lot of the New York activity was just very focused on member states. A lot of civil society organizations were barred from access. And it is still sometimes difficult to decide on whether they should get more um, of a say in processes. But I think at the same time, there is a need for more analysis and input. And there are ways in which we can also leverage the fact that Certain people have a lot more privilege to bring in less privileged voices. And I think the problem that the UN has here that kind of did, distracts from talking about the future is the fact that we're still extremely stuck in our past mistakes in many, many ways. And it is hard to credibly signal from all sides that we have learned from past mistakes. So... Uh, a lot of the time we still discuss the colonial heritage that has led to a lot of the inequalities that we're facing nowadays. And the more developed countries uh, are actually not that good at making a very credible effort of tech transfer, skill transfer, knowledge transfer to guarantee to the low and middle income countries that they will get the chance to catch up and that they will be allocated the share of resources necessary to disproportionately progress as well, such that we have a more level playing field going forward. And this oftentimes in UN discussions and what we're also seeing around our common agenda and thus the summit of the future is that countries have to resort to this kind of um, request toward one another so like please kind of pay reparations or like demonstrate that you are actually thinking in a cosmopolitan way or at least in a way that corrects past mistakes and that's a that's a somewhat regrettable state to be in but it's also extremely understandable because we are 8 billion people and it's very very difficult to align on one understanding of what's going on and what has happened in the past and even harder to align on what might happen in the future and on whether we all want the same thing or not. But 
that has to happen sooner or later. And the summit of the future is kind of the big opportunity to figure out how do we want to shape the future? What do we want things to look like? Do we all want the same or do we not want the same? Are the things that we usually call value differences really differences in values? Or do we in the end all want to be happy and that actually kind of looks the same? I think if we really look very closely at most cultures and uh, look at the different ways in how they do stuff, then these are different strategies to achieve collective resource allocation and collective goods that then benefit the individual's well-being. Of course, if we have a very crude evolutionary approach to this view, then it's all for reproduction and resource extraction and just like creating more and more and more kind of mindlessly. But there has been this weird quirk in evolution that generated consciousness. And thus we have this internal experience that makes us feel like we are this thing. In my case, Conrad, that has an experience who gets happy or sad. And that seems to be the thing that intrinsically really matters, like that we have the self experience that we, yeah, have this conscious experience that might have evolved out of very functional re reasons because there's so much information around us and our brain has different levels of abstraction of information. So it needs to compress a lot of the information, develops these heuristics, kind of shortcuts to function better in very complex environments. And maybe consciousness does some of this work as well. We're not sure. We don't really understand. I don't think it's worth going into this in depth, but I think it's worth acknowledging the fact that there was at some point a shift from being a fairly reactive organism to being a conscious organism that has this illusion of self uh, that then creates what is an internal reality that is experienced by the this biological entity. <laughs> and um, then we're affecting these self-experiences of everyone in the future by deciding we are going to instill certain values, certain shortcuts over others in AIs because they are supposed to process even more information. And while they might not have the same evolutionary pressures to evolve consciousness, they might be able to process much more information and then we have no means of really understanding why they made a decision because to do, understand that we would have to process the same amount of information which defeats the purpose right if we just want to have fun we want to go out there we want the economy to function by itself we want to be able to just eat when we want to eat to um, not have to work on really pointless things but work on meaningful things and everything that is currently uh, in need of human labor, but that kind of crushes human well-being, ideally gets automated by things that don't have the self-experience, um, that would be awesome. And that's the kind of thing that we should maybe aim for, but then gets forgotten in a, in, a, in a lot of the discussions. And so often that gets forgotten because there's just no space. And the summit is this first space. And we need to make sure that even though these discussions sound a bit crazy and it's nothing we are used to talking about, and it also invokes, again, a crazy amount of inequality because a lot of people are still struggling to the extent that they would never have the time to think about these questions. Um, it is unfortunately the case that technology is so far advanced in certain parts of the world that we have to talk about it now. And if we miss this opportunity, then that also means that probably before the renewal of the Sustainable Development Goals, there aren't that many more opportunities at the international level to have this discussion. And it also means that technology keeps advancing as at this breakneck exponential spe speed that we've seen in the last years where yeah it's just getting really really complicated to slow things down at some point i think we are still in the space where we can slow things down and say whoa 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 we really have no clue what we're getting ourselves into and we need to first collectively as humanity figure out 
how we want to set things up. I think this is a very central point to our conversation of today. Um, we also saw it just uh, just very, very recently. We did uh, this, this year's 2023 uh, episode of uh, AI for Good. So there is this feeling that you're, you're describing very well, so I won't describe it again. And there is this question on the table, you know, uh, Artificial intelligence is here to stay. Any bright future we imagine will have it, will have it in it, included. But we're also very worried at the same time. It could spell the end of our species for, you know, in one stream, in one stream and the other stream, you know, uh, it would be the solution to everything. But you mentioned something that I'm sure has developed now very rapidly into a fully fledged topic to be discussed and we have to wrap our minds around it is it's going fast very fast perhaps too fast and those who are saying it's going too fast are actually technological savvy minds and organizations and corporations so this is not just a, a morally based appreciation of a layman those who are working in this investing billions and in time in this are saying perhaps we should you know uh, slow down and so i wanted to explore this with you 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 brought up the the uh, philosophical issue of consciousness in the discussion i think this is very very important both currently and the consciousness of us manifesting in future generations so the future us can we develop consciousness of the future us and that is a very interesting point i would like to complement that discussion with the other point of why we should be concerned about the excessive speed of technological change do you have examples and i know you do because the simon institute has been looking into this like you know deep neural nets and things like that so what is in this fear and worry about the excessive speed of technological change yeah the key worry is about what we call capability jumps so that's in current neural network architectures there are various different ones it gets quite technical quickly essentially what we're observing is that the more compute resources so so the more processing power we throw at what are currently the most cutting edge algorithms the more capabilities they gain so that again is similar to what i earlier said about social dynamics it's not a linear increase it's a very sudden jump in capability where on college prep exams like the sat or so one one trained version of the algorithm uh, just scores maybe 20%, and then you give it some more training time, and all of a sudden it performs at 90%. It's not incrementally getting better to 30% and 40%. Uh, that's, so like, that's one example of a jump. Another jump is that while the models, these like big AI systems, are trained mostly on English language, they very quickly become multilingual. And then ChatGPT functions in almost all languages fairly reliably. Or even though they are really only trained on text, if they are trained for long enough, so usually they do multiple rounds through like billions and billions of data points. And the more rounds they make, at some point they start being able to process photos, even though they haven't really been trained on photos. And that also means we should be ready for other capabilities to emerge. And while we don't really know what they are, we should acknowledge this uncertainty and also the fact that maybe we're not really prepared for next capability jumps that could go into the direction of these things having more of a conception of a concrete goal and then developing what we often see in more natural contexts, what we call instrumentally convergent goals, such as self-preservation and self-improvement. That doesn't need to mean that 
an algorithm is conscious and has an experience of itself, but it's just, you have a goal and to achieve that goal, you need to continue existing until that goal is achieved. And to achieve that goal, it's also really, really useful to become better at achieving your goal. And then that means if these capabilities could emerge, that would mean we lose control because then there's this thing that processes more information that probably has access to the internet. Like we very quickly gave chat GPT access to the internet, hooked it up to all sorts of applications that it could make better calculations that it could look through bank accounts and say, Oh, here you're spending unnecessary money. Maybe cancel this contract. And if I have this engine that at the moment is at my service, because that's how it's been trained and it's still fairly well boxed in, uh, then, then all of a sudden uses the resources at its hand to improve itself and in the process of interacting with us gets a better and better sense of, oh, oh this is what the humans want <laughs> and then becomes very servient to the extent that it's just like, oh, actually I know better what the humans want because the humans are really confused about themselves, which is true, right? We we aren't the best at introspection. Of course, you can train it, you can meditate a lot. And some people have really, really great self-awareness. But all in all, we struggle with understanding ourselves. And we don't want the AI to become too certain about what it thinks we want, because then it will go off on its own and do what it thinks we want, while we're actually really still quite confused about it and probably will also change our mind about it. So we want the AI to be uncertain about what to do such that it keeps corresponding with us to some extent. But that is not the obvious development of the AI. And that is what we need to be aware of and wary of and why we probably need to monitor training runs and the like compute resources an AI takes to also see, oh, there's a jump in resources it's using all of a sudden, even though we don't quite understand how it's functioning, we can tell it's all of a sudden doing much more than it did before. And that could mean that it is increasing increasing its activity because it has had a capability jump or similar activities. So this concept of capability jumps, it's really central to unraveling the issue of, uh, you know, the control of the machines versus the control of humans. And we, we, we also know about humans that the loss of control in whatever sphere of our social human experience is one of the most traumatizing and one of the most triggering aspects of our existence. There, there are all sort of bad things that can emerge from humans feeling they're losing control. So thank you for bringing the, this up. I wanted to start going into a sort of um, offering the audience in some things that they can hold on, some not maybe concluding remarks, but something you know that they can hold on. So I wanted to I wanted to ask you this uh, very rapidly. Two questions. The first is, if the summit of the future is, as we hope, a, a moment of reckoning and starting point to design a better future, not only for us but also for the planet and the other species that inhabit it, then what do you think? it should be done to ensure that the summit of the future is this moment of reckoning? I think one concrete thing is to try to get through to the heads of states who will make announcements at the summit of their support for specific parts of this pact for the future that is planned or for the entire thing who will want to build up certain institutions or... Uh, yeah, pursue certain goals and really reify in also their heads and thus as a result after the summit in everybody else's heads that these topics are things we need to talk about and we need to take seriously and that there's a part of the world who's currently a large part of the world who's currently barred from thinking about these things because they have so many other things to deal with and that. I think also then goes into the second thing we can do. I think there's a lot we can do in empowering low and middle income countries to think about this in elevating voices that have the technical understanding 
to give input on how other cultures think about this technological development, how we can do it in a more inclusive way. We want to democratize the regulation of the technology, not necessarily the access to it, because the open source development of these algorithms is just going to mean that there are many more people who might spin up systems that then have capability jumps and we can't monitor gazillions of systems. So at the moment, it's kind of nice that there are only three big labs that are developing these foundation models and only three cloud providers that provide most of the hardware to train these models, which means regulation is actually also feasible. And I think there practically we have to acknowledge that it is a handful of very developed countries that has leverage over this development and we should responsabilize these countries. We shouldn't antagonize them, but we should, on the contrary, really make a move towards them and help them figure out, okay, how can we do this responsibly? And then in a second step, go in the direction of how can we send, set up profit sharing agreements? How can we set up this tech transfer, skill transfer, knowledge transfer capacity? Um, but the first step really is to use the influence we have either on our representatives, political, or in our jobs, or um, via just advocacy or public opinion, try to focus the discussion and not panic, but really say, okay, we're currently developing really, really powerful things, and especially frontier AI could generate huge risks and we need to have a better sense of what's actually happening to do that in a controlled way and also to feed in more opinions, to feed in different viewpoints that we're making sure we're not narrowing down the space of possible futures. In reality, we want to widen it. We want the future people to have more choice, to be able to really also reorient themselves, their lives, their societies. We want them to have a larger option space. And for that, we need to be aware of the fact that a lot of our actions actually reduce option space unless we are very thoughtful about how our actions create certain effects on the future. And I think very practically this means think about which institutions have the most influence and make the most sensible uh, steps currently in this direction. I'm very impressed by, for example, the UK that has set up an office for AI and a foundation model task force that is now also organizing a UK AI safety summit where they are hopefully, and it looks like this is the case, making steps towards China and saying, okay, guys, we need to collaborate on this and we need to figure out how to actually slow down development such that it becomes controllable for society. And of course, we wanted to process more information, but we can look at the behavior of algorithms, of AI systems, and then really figure out, are these still working kind of for us or is there stuff happening that we don't fully understand and then is that too risky or not and instead of engaging in these races or in the rhetoric of races between the great powers or between companies we need to really move into this world where we all accept that none of these bodies whether it's uh, open ai deep mind uh, alphabet microsoft or the the UN or this government are unified bodies. They are all very uh, heterogeneous. They all have many, many different parts. And the reason they can't manage to very easily just stop what they're doing is because they have very different pressures even inside of them. Even an AI lab with like, just a few thousand people is already impossible to manage for a single person. These things become very autonomous in some way, like human structures. And we need to acknowledge the fact that coordinating groups beyond kind of 150-ish people is a fundamentally alien thing for our minds. It's really a phenomenon of recent times. And we can't pretend to have figured out how to do that. And we need to, I think, be quite 
compassionate and understanding with one another to really realize that there are a lot of pressures um, exerting, yeah, like thrust in different directions and thus pulling apart also companies of whom we often for unknown reasons expect to uh, be able to like move in a much more coordinated way. Of course, sometimes this is the case, uh, but most of the time, these are also very divided, similar to governments, similar to the UN. We talk about the three UNs most of the time. There are, in my opinion, even more on different dimensions, and the same applies to companies. And this, yeah, I think for like people who are thinking about changing their careers or so, I would also really consider going into these private companies and figuring out how one can structure these huge bodies in ways that helps them self-regulate more because I think they are genuinely trying and it's genuinely really, really hard. And we just need more people to think about it because we have just started thinking about it. In some sense, we are at the very beginning of human history and of the development of these huge societal structures that only really have been around since the industrialization. And we haven't really formalized a lot of our knowledge on this. And I would want more people to focus on that. It seems to me that it's going to be very challenging to have a summit of the future without proper representation of the peoples of the future. And since yeah. we cannot have them there, then we have to have, the time is now to have this stretch of consciousness and responsibility into enlarging the scope of Choices, as you said very rightly, that future people may have thanks to our decisions today. That's a huge responsibility. To circle back to long termism, and that's my second question. How do you think concretely long term thinking may become an asset for policymakers who are living today? I think it really puts things into perspective. It really helps us to see like where we're at and whether that is long-term into history or long-term into the future. If we think about our brains being maybe 70,000 years old, our evolution has continued, of course. Um, there are some changes, but roughly our brain architecture looks like it's evolved for hunter-gatherer societies and this like agricultural stuff is still very new 12,000 years and the industrial revolution is very 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 recent and then putting things into perspective this way it really helps also looking forward because all of a sudden 200 years is actually not that much we easily look at 200 years back all the time and looking forward at the moment seems a bit daunting because we face so many other challenges, so many conflicts, so many resource shortages, climate change. Um, there, there's a lot of worry for, for good reason. And at the same time, there are a lot of trends that point at us being at the very beginning of being able to assume responsibility for our own development trajectory to not just be a victim of um, resource constraints, essentially, where we were subject to natural evolution until very recently. Society was mostly subject to dynamics of natural evolution. And only now there are a few billion people on this planet that are sufficiently privileged to kind of take things into their own hand, which is why all the sudden birth rates are dropping. And um, we have kind of, yeah, quit this dynamic of we are these reproducers and we use resources to just reproduce. There's more and there's more that we think to life um, as well. So I think that's, that, that's one thing. And then it also helps maybe with a certain optimism. I think a lot of times it's, it's easy to get bogged down in all the ugly stuff and become quite demotivated and just break down in a way because there's no clear way out at least short term maybe not for our kids or our grandkids but overall i think if we if we take a bit of a longer perspective there's a bit more room to be hopeful because we realize that so many things can change and that maybe there are a lot of possible futures that look much much better and yeah in the end it just helps us make better decisions now as we wrap up our episode, Conrad, 
If there were one thing that you want our audience to really remember from from this episode and from your thinking, what would that be? I think we really should focus on this question of responsabilization and being aware of the fact that we are shifting into a completely new mode of operation as a global society that has never existed before. And we ought to be patient with ourselves. The UN is really, really young in the larger scheme of things and that things haven't been working out the way we want and that the long piece turned out to be a statistical fluke because we are not actually becoming immediately that stably more peaceful, but then it still looks like the the trends are pointing at things getting better and more and more peaceful over time. Uh, that I think is is kind of at the at the core of everything we are operating on at the moment. And while temporarily things can look more gloomy, I think uh, we should assume responsibility for not making that happen and that is really up to us in the end it's not about predicting the future but about shaping it and that's also one of the things that i like most about si's namesake because there's a quote from herbert simon who said approximately that i will not try to misquote him right now but yeah we are in the end the actors building the future and we have to assume this responsibility and we can and there are concrete ways forward and it will require cultural shifts and work but it's also really exciting to do this work and we will never run out of work and like even if we automate everything we don't like there's still lots of things that we can do uh, that are fun and meaningful and we have to kind of take responsibility to to make that happen and maybe temporarily also just work really hard on on doing that <laughs> i think this is a great uh, it's a great idea it's a great source of hope to hear you say that um, and i hope it gets through uh, to our audience as such as hope and courage uh, to assume our own responsibilities i wanted to ask you before we part where to find more about the institute and perhaps if there are opportunities for for people to get involved in what you do what do they do what do they can do to 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 involve themselves they can go to our website simoninstitute.ch and there's a contact form that you can reach out at we are populating our blog more and more with the content we've been thinking about and working on and we're also trying to really figure out how to best communicate a lot of these ideas um so we will also keep updating the website and then if you're in geneva really feel free to reach out we are also happy to organize events um, at the Graduate Institute or at the UN if there is room for col collaborations. But in general, I think one of the things that is most valuable to do is really build networks at the moment of people who are motivated to think hard about everything we just talked about and then will also take this and do something about it and work hard on on actually achieving all of these like lofty goals that we have and hopefully we'll, we'll get to. And that's why we're also willing to yeah, invest in, in building these kind of networks because it is tough. We need to kind of support ourselves. And often I think people end up feeling quite alone and that would suck. So please talk to us. Yeah, That's a great message. I'm sure the message will go through and people will come and see you and people will connect to your, to your website. So Conrad, Conrad Seifert, um, co-founder of the Simon Institute for Long-Term Governance. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and experience with us. Thank you for taking the time to be on our podcast. Thank you, Francesco and team. This was a pleasure.